Good morning, students. I'm Mr. Boscarini, and for our unit on forces, well, today the lesson will be about forces. So, today we're going to see the following. We're going to see how to define a force. So, we're going to see the definition of a force. What is the unit in the international system of units and how we can measure forces. And finally, we'll see how we can draw the forces acting on an object. So we will see what we call a force diagram. Of course, we will start with a definition. So we're going to answer the question, what is a force? And this is something we already seen in middle school. Now, we know already uh, the answer to this question. So just, this is just a review, actually, of uh, the definition of a force, which we have here. So let's read it together. So a force is a push or a pull or a turning effect. We're going to see more about this in another video. And this push-pull turning effect will be exerted. Exerted is a fancy word to say apply, but you'll see also in your textbook, instead of saying a force applied on another object, we'll say exerted. So force is exerted by an object on another object. And this is a very key concept. Uh, forces are always the result of the interaction between two or more objects. So we never have a force on its own acting on an object. It's always something applying an object on something else. And as we will see in the lesson about Newton's third law, it actually uh, we'll see that forces come in pairs. As I apply a force on you, you will apply a force on me. And here you see the representation of a force. You have someone kicking a football. And of course, a force will be defined not only by its size, what we call the magnitude, but also the direction. And we have a name for this kind of physical quantities. Yes, indeed force is a vector, so it's represented by an arrow. So every time we have an object and we have um, forces acting on this object, we can represent these forces using arrows. And as you can see here in this slide, we have two examples. We'll start with a sailboat, a sailboat which apparently is not moving, but still, even if it's not moving, we have at least two forces acting on the sailboat. The weight, which you know, it's the uh, pull of gravity uh, towards the center of the earth. Boat, but there's also the upthrust, the push from the water that allows our sailboat to float. Without this, the, the uh, sailboat would just sink into the water. Let's see. Again. Now, and, and again, I'm, I'm simplifying here. I'm not showing all the forces acting on the plane, but two of the main ones. The first one is the thrust. Now the engines, in this case the jet engines of our plane, will apply a forward force, and you can see it by these two red arrows, but also as every object moving through air, the airplane is experiencing air resistance, which is, which is a force which is always opposing motion, and we're going to represent it here with this arrow pointing backwards. And these are just a few examples of forces acting on objects. We're going to see many more, but uh, what you have here is exactly uh, what I told you before. These are force diagrams. So, representation of objects and representation of forces acting on those objects. And as for every physical quantity we've met so far, distance, time, speed, and many more that we will find later on, um, uh, well, we already found also mass, but as you will go on in physics, you'll meet temperature, you'll meet energy, and so on. All these physical quantities, in order to be physical quantities, need to be measured. So what is the instrument we can use to measure force? Again, you know the answer because you've met it before in middle school, and he, that this is the object, and it has many, many names. Uh, we could call it a Newton meter, we could call it a force meter. More often, it's called the spring balance. And the reason is very simple because it has a spring inside. You cannot see it in this 
specific spring balance. So I draw here in red. So this object measures the forces applied on it. And let's review very, very quickly the components of a spring balance. First of all, we have a handle, which is this part here on the top. Now the handle, as the name says, allows us, for instance, to hold the spring balance in one hand and pull it with the other or apply a force on, on the other side. Um, or you can hang your spring balance, for instance, from a, a stand, like we will do in class many, many times. Second, we have a scale. Of course, we have a reading. And you will see that different models of spring balances have different scales. But what they all have in common, they will all measure in newtons. That, that's it. That's the unit in the international system of units for force. The base unit is called the newton. And as it is for all those units that take the name from someone, in this case Sir Isaac Newton, uh, we will write the unit with a small letter. You see, Newton is not capital, but when we write it as an abbreviation, as a symbol, we'll use the capital letter, letter N. So we have a scale. As I told you, there's a spring inside. On the other hand, with respect to the handle, we have a hook. Hook is where you're going to apply the force. You're going to hang stuff. You're going to pull it. So you can see um, on this on this side we can apply the force and finally screw here on the top this is the zero adjust and if you think a little bit you will remember we've met the zero adjust before we met it in the case of the balance again it's very very important that you check that your instrument measures zero when there's nothing hanging from here if not, you'll need to turn the zero adjust knob. To finish our very short video about forces, um, it's important also that we have a sense of how big is a Newton. I mean, based on our previous experience, we know how long a meter is, uh, how much time it takes for one second to pass. Uh, we have a feeling of how heavy is a kilogram, but how big is a Newton? And in order to understand it, but you will see it more um, easily when we're going to try different spring balances, is by giving some examples. And I have three examples here of the typical forces needed to perform some actions. For instance, if you want to open a soda can, um, so if you want to lift the tab here, you will need a force of about 20 newtons. If you want to flip a switch, so turn from on and off and vice versa, you need a force of about 10 newtons. On the other hand, if you want to lift a very, very heavy bag, uh, almost to the limit of what's allowed in um, airplanes now, you will need a force of 200 newtons. And again, you see how I represented the different forces with arrows, giving the direction of a force, but also the relative size of the arrows gives you an idea that one force is bigger than the other. Although, of course, I should have made this arrow 10 times longer than this one, because 200 is 10 times as long as 20, but uh, it wouldn't have fit in this drawing. But just to give you an idea that this force is much much bigger than these two. In the next lesson we're going to see, we'll start to see the effect of forces in motion. But for, for today that's all. Goodbye from Mr. Boscarini.